I'm very pleased that Uganda is hosting the Africa Growth Forum and have such a bunch of very polite people who refrain from telling me they couldn't hear a word I say. <laughs> this is the first Africa-wide meeting of IDC network of researchers and senior policymakers. As the Prime Minister has pointed out, we've made remarkable progress in Africa, but we're still faced with a number of challenges and concerns that growth is failing to transform into development. Development being inclusive and sustainable growth. We need to transform our economies, enhance the productivity of the private sector, and create enough quality jobs for our people. I'm confident we'll all learn a lot from the current research into these ideas and our areas of that is to be presented over the next two days. We should all participate actively to learn from each other and continue the conversation between researchers and policy makers from across Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm particularly interested because of my mandate to be Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development in Uganda. It means I can't get away from myself. I have to look at the financing and I have to look to see how the finances are, are being spent. Uh, the Prime Minister mentioned four areas. First of all, the lack of inclusive growth and our failure to meet, our potential failure to meet the first Millennium Development Goal of reducing poverty. In my ministership, the first Millennium Development Goal, I think, says, says it all. Because if we combine that goal <coughs> and combine that idea that the private sector is the engine of growth, basically need to help our people to help themselves achieve the other millennium goals. The widening inequality is, is, is a concern, as is the unemployment among, especially among the youth who could be either dividend or a time bomb. The infrastructure deficit we've all talked about many, many times, and the need for education that is focused on the marketplace needs. Uh, we have a dictionary in Uganda whereby our universities Turn out more and more graduates every year who then walk the streets looking for jobs. And at the same time, the private sector, the private sector complains that they don't have enough, uh, enough manpower. We need to shift the education focus to concentrate on what the market needs. And that is something I, I, I hope to hear a lot more about in the next few days. How to move our ideas from the lab to the field how to move the think tank from think tank to the street, how to make sure that the financing mechanisms and uh, programs we come up with reflect the, the, the areas to be financed. How can we make sure that the limited money that we are able to raise is well spent with accountability, performance benchmarks, performance evaluation, and most of all, it, Paying back to make sure it can be ploughed back into that insatiable uh, uh, monster called the need for development funds. At, at this moment, I'd like to invite the first the first panel onto the onto the podium. I'd like to ask Professor Jonathan Lee, the executive director of the Inter of the International Growth Center, to start us off on the next session. Thank you. Honorable Minister, members of our Parliament, and uh, our guests from across the continent, but also from uh, many different countries uh, beyond, a welcome. It's a pleasure and a privilege to have you all here with us for this first uh, inaugural African Growth Forum. I'd like to begin by thanking the Minister uh, and the Deputy Governor for the strong support they provided for this initiative, uh, for co-hosting with us and sponsoring with us this first <coughs> African Growth Forum, but also for their leadership in determining the agenda, which we've now heard from the Prime Minister is a very ambitious agenda here in Uganda, but across the continent as well. It's altogether fitting that the first African Growth Forum be held here in Uganda, where the very high rates of growth that we've heard the Right Honorable Prime Minister mention this morning, but also the Governor mentioned yesterday, 
evening is the result of a remarkable transformation in policy and in governance in this country. And it's an example that we've seen across the continent, and which has, as they've emphasized, led to a transformation in growth across the continent. But it's fitting for another reason as well. Uganda has set an example in its keenness to open, be open and learn from the rest of the world. Its keenness to bring in evidence and research into its policy making. A characteristic that is increasingly evident across the, across the continent, and one that is very much at the heart of what the International Growth Center is all about. The mission of the IGC is to promote sustainable growth by providing demand-driven policy advice based on frontier research by working with our partner countries here in Africa, also in South Asia, to address these challenges as, as uh, enumerated so eloquently by the Prime Minister, and in helping governments to bring evidence-based decision-making to the heart of their growth <coughs> policy. All countries face challenges in feeding evidence and research into policy. On the one hand, policymakers face an array of challenges. Time pressures above all. Policymaking very often has a time frame of a day or a week, perhaps a month if we're lucky. But very tight time pressures often affect policy decision making. But there are also political, uh, quite rightly, political considerations and social and sometimes ideological influences as well. Not to mention, as the Honorable Minister reminded us, financial constraints on governments and the institutions that are charged with carrying out policy. On the other hand, relevant evidence is often simply unavailable, in part because the world has a nasty habit of throwing up new problems or old problems in new contexts that require new research and new analysis. But also, if we're honest, because researchers often end up working on the wrong questions or perhaps working on the right questions, but unavailable, unaware of how their findings can feed into policy. These challenges are often exacerbated in Africa by research gaps and weak connections with international researchers. On the one hand, policymakers may lack the access they want to relevant research and researchers. On the other hand, researchers may lack the access they need to policymakers in order to understand the relevant research questions about obstacles to growth, in order to understand the policy relevance of their own findings. At the heart of the International Growth Center is a new model, a model that seeks to overcome these challenges by combining, on the one hand, long-term country engagement through sustained country teams that develop their own broad networks of policymakers, of key stakeholders in the private sector, NGOs, and academics, on the basis of which they're able to identify the key policy challenges facing the country. But on the other hand, a global network of leading researchers from the top institutions around the world that are interested and committed to engaging with these issues. It is a model that combines the best available knowledge from frontier research with local knowledge to enhance the ability of local policymakers to find their own solutions to growth problems. It's a model that not only connects policymakers to the stock of existing, the stock of knowledge from existing research, but also and crucially brings policymakers into the knowledge creation process. 
that helps us through a constructive relationship between researchers and policymakers to open new areas of research and to feed directly into policy the findings of world-leading research. The main focus of the International Growth Center in the next four years will be in four, year, four areas. Areas which, as will become evident, touch on all of the themes highlighted today for us by the Prime Minister, but also yesterday evening by the Governor and by uh, Professor Collier. In the first instance, we'll focus on state effectiveness. Issues, as have been mentioned this morning by the Honorable Minister, of governance and the challenges of governance as we move forward. Not only maintaining momentum, but facing new challenges in the area of natural resources and their management. But also the nitty gritty of taxing and spending in the part of government. As Oriana Bandiera, my colleague at LSE, who will be speaking in the conference, reminds us, governments are made of people. And effective governance requires the effective use of the people in government. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So state effectiveness is a crucial area, and in some sense the starting point. Without an effective state, growth and development is simply not possible. The second area is firm capabilities. Growth ultimately can only be sustained on the basis of sustained increases in productivity. And that raises a host of challenges across the array of different types of firms, both by size, by sector. IGC research has highlighted how the developing economies in Africa and in Asia look different from developed economies. That at the top end, the successful firms actually do look pretty much like these successful firms in developed countries. But at the bottom end, the distribution of firms and their productivity in Africa and South Asia as well looks very different. That in Africa, there's a long tail of unproductive firms. There's a long tail of small firms who never, in practice, ever become big firms. So something is impeding the growth of firms in Africa <coughs> that we need to understand better. Google, in Africa, never gets out of the garage. That too often, small firms are subsistence activities that remain for their entire existence, subsistence level activities. And we need to understand better what drives productivity growth and what can be done to facilitate productivity growth in Africa. We know part of the story. Part of the story is the enabling environment created by the state. Uh, our Red Island Prime Minister reminded us the importance of transport networks for getting goods to market without losing half of their value. We also know the importance of a functioning legal system so that trust networks can be extend beyond family members and that we have reliable, legally reinforced trust mechanisms on the basis of which firms can expand. We also know, as the Prime Minister reminded us, that trade is at the heart of this. And we need to think not only about obstacles to regional trade and how those can be overcome through the recent protocol and many of the actions that have been agreed recently uh, by the heads of state, but also by the obstacles to internal trade and how we can improve the efficiencies of internal markets. We need to understand entrepreneurship better and how we can support entrepreneurship. The third area of research that we'll be focusing on is cities. In here too, we had a reminder yesterday evening by Professor Collier of just how important cities are to economic growth and development. If we look at the developed world, a very substantial fraction of economic production and crucially of economic innovation happens in cities. When we look at Africa, and we too often see dysfunctional cities. How can we overcome? the challenges posed by those cities and enable Africa to enjoy the full fruits of innovation and of growth that come from having productive cities. And finally, our fourth area is energy. We know that crucial to the development of, of uh, countries across Africa will be securing sustainable access to energy in the coming years. And that's a big challenge. It's a challenge which not only has technical 
uh, elements to it. It has crucial economic elements to it, and it has crucial governance aspects to it as well. Well, the program for today and tomorrow underscores the vast range of activities where the IGC is already involved and wants to be involved in the coming years in addressing these challenges uh, as we move forward. And let me just give you a couple of examples of the kind of research that the IGC has been already involved in in recent years. We're thinking about firms in five countries across Africa. My colleague John Sutton has done a project mapping out the capabilities of the largest firms in the economy. In a way to understand better what existing capabilities look like, but also to understand the challenges to industrialization, the challenges to, to growth from manufacturing firms in Africa. And what he's found is that Africa does look different, that there's a missing middle in Africa, that there's capabilities in certain areas, including many that people weren't aware of, but there are ranges of important sectors where Africa lacks capabilities. And we need strategies for understanding how those capabilities can be developed. John's now working in Tanzania to understand how Tanzania can take advantage of the new investment that will come in following the natural resource discoveries, discoveries of natural gas, and to use those inward investments as a way to connect local industry to international supply chains in a way that can lead to the development of new industrial capabilities that can underpin a step change in growth in Tanzania. John's also working, working in Ethiopia with the investment agency there to help them to completely restructure how they work with international investors, again, to support the development of domestic capabilities. Chris Adam has led the important work that the Red Army Prime Minister mentioned this morning on supporting heads of state uh, moving towards agreement over a monetary union for East Africa. And even short of that, there's important steps that can be taken in coordinating policy, whether that's through settlement systems or information exchange. In Ghana, Chris Udry and colleagues has highlighted how access to credit in agriculture can be crucial for enabling farmers to overcome obstacles, either obstacles in technology, enabling and giving them access to effective pest control or improved seeds, or just giving them the luxury of not selling immediately so they can sell their output when the price is right. In Rwanda, IGC has looked at the very important Garika program, the One Cow program, and highlighted its great potential, its potential to deliver $100 per annum to households, but at the same time, highlighting how the current program is operating well below its capacity and needs to be addressed, particularly in the area of the productivity with which the assets are used. Here in Uganda, Andrew Zeitman has been working on the problem of teacher absenteeism and looking at whether monitoring is effective, increased local management and monitoring is effective in increasing teacher presence and fighting absenteeism, or what about the interaction between that in financial incentives, and we'll talk more about that uh, in this conference. And then finally, uh, Oriana Bandiera, who will be speaking here, has done important research working with the Minister of, Ministry of Health in Zambia, which has an ambitious program of spreading uh, thousands of community health assistants throughout the country to substantially raise the quality of health care uh, in rural areas. And like every government, they face the challenge of how to get the best people. And there's a very widespread uh, conception that, perception that community attachment and community spiritedness is a very important way to attract effective people. But we know there are other things that can be used in recruitment. One of those is using career advancement as a way to attract ambitious people into these positions. So the question arose, and the Ministry of Health was facing this question, well, which should we use? Should we appeal to people's career ambitions, or should we appeal to their community spiritedness? Oriana and colleagues set up a randomized experiment to test which of those would be more effective, and she'll talk about some of the results. But in short, what they found was, actually, 
career advancement was a very powerful tool, not only for recruiting better, more qualified applicants who still remained committed to their communities. There wasn't any displacement of the community spirit in this. But also led to the appointment of people who were more productive in post, who saw more households during the day, who ran more meetings, who were more effective as community health assistants. So that's an example of where working closely with the ministry, IGC researchers were able to identify concrete lessons of how to make the state more effective by making the people who make up the government more effective. Well, let me just close with a couple final thoughts. The first is that we're very pleased uh, to have all of you with us for these two days. The program of this conference very much embodies what the IGC is all about, bringing together researchers and policymakers, as we've done in each of the sessions over the next couple of days. I wanted to mention that IGC will be tweeting using this hashtag, Africa Growth, and we hope you'll join us uh, in the sessions and contribute yourself, both during the conference, but also uh, afterwards. I also wanted to mention that IGC has just closed its first open call for research, and we'll be doing this regularly, at least every six, six months from now on, and that we welcome the widest possible range of research proposals particularly in our areas of focus, the four areas I mentioned, but in other areas as well where they're relevant to countries. We hope this is going to give us access to new areas of research and new researchers, and we welcome your proposals and those of researchers that you may be in contact with. Finally, I'm very pleased to announce that we are today launching a new website aimed at promoting this dialogue between policymakers and researchers on it issues of, of growth in Africa. The site is, the, the site is ideasforafrica.net, and it is very new, just launched this week, so you won't find it yet if you search on Google, but if you can type in that URL, ideasforafrica.net, then you'll find uh, the site. And the idea is really to showcase a range of different areas where research is and can feed effectively into policy where exciting ideas are emerging from not only the IGC research network, but elsewhere as well. Not only from research done in Africa, but from research done around the world. And we welcome your suggestions on how this site can be developed. We're at the early stages now. We've launched it officially today. We'd like you all to take a look and to come back to us with your suggestions so that we can feed those in as we develop the site in the coming, in the coming months. Our ambition is that this become the go-to site for research into policy in Africa. That by showcasing the best of research in Africa, we can stimulate more active discussions, more broad-ranging discussions across the continent on the crucial issues facing Africa today. Let me just close by thanking again our hosts, the Ministry of uh, Finance, Economic, uh, Planning, uh, sorry, planning and economic development, uh, the Bank of Uganda, for their generous sponsorship, but also uh, for allowing us to co-host with them uh, this forum. It's a great privilege to be in such good company. And I wish you all a very productive two days. Thank you.